You know who else had that attitude? Dennis Pitta. Yes, he did. He's our first guest. Started his BYU career as a walk-on. Ended what? as the Cougars' all-time leader among tight ends with 2,901 receiving yards, 83 receptions in a single season, and number two among tight ends with 21 touchdown receptions. One back of the legendary Gordon Hudson. Who I played with. Also a Super Bowl champion. Caught a touchdown in the world's biggest football game, defeating the 49ers. 34-31 to 31 in Super Bowl 47. That was in 2014. Please welcome the great Dennis Pitta, live from California. Hey, you shaved and pulled it all together for us tonight. Thank you so much for being and, and, here. And Dennis, the hair is on Anytime. point. You're looking good, brother. <laughs> is it? Thank you. I no, just, it, uh, it's good. I just showered and got cleaned up for you guys. We appreciate that. So, And it's especially good. Here, I just have to tell you, Dennis, do you know how on Sports Nation – when, when Dave or I co-host, and they always make us read at the end. They're like, hey, make sure you say sorry to Dennis Pitta. That kills me every time. Like, it hits me deep. I don't even do it. I don't even do Dave it. Won't, Dave won't do it. I'm like, okay, I'll go along with it, but, but I don't like it. <laughs> But here, Listen, the, it's, I, I appreciate that. But you know, as long as your name's getting mentioned, I guess it's, <laughs> so it's positive, okay. Right? It's okay. It may be in a negative context, but. Uh, you know, they're still saying my name over there, so I'm doing something right. Every single day on Sports Nation, Dennis's name gets mentioned as they go out, out yeah. to the last break. So that is something. <laughs> we have Unfor plenty of time un for you tonight. Un so. Unforgettable. It's awesome. Yeah, well, thank you, guys. Yeah, hey. Jerem, he uh, he thinks he's being mean to me by saying my name every night, but really the joke's on him. He's saying my name every day, <laughs> and uh, I'm getting the attention out of it. So. That, my, my, that that bit you guys did when you had all the kids, for the awards, remember that? And, and you <laughs> yeah, had all yeah. the kids, and they were ready with the signs and all that. That is that is one of the classic all-time Sports Nation bits I've ever seen. It was great. <laughs> my kids really enjoyed being a part of that one. So they, fun. Uh, they were all pumped up, ready to be uh, ready to be on TV, and um, – they, they still watch that one back all the time because they're, uh, they're TV stars now. <laughs> Dennis, we're watching a, a handful of former Cougars trying to make NFL rosters right now, this month. How hard is it to crack into that 53-man roster? Yeah, it, it, it can be very difficult. They, there's a lot of different factors, though. I mean, are you drafted? Are you undrafted? Um, you know, are you a guy on the bubble trying to make it on special teams? Are you, you know, a guy that's going to be – you know, contributor, a daily contributor on offense or defense. I mean, there's just so many, uh, you know, different scenarios for a lot of those guys. And, you know, you have guys like Fred Warner and, and Kyle Van Noy and uh, those guys that are just, you know, great players. And, uh, you know, Fred might be the best linebacker in the game right now. And so you have those guys and you have guys that are, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, just trying to make the roster and do whatever they can to hang on. And, and a lot of that is through special teams and, um, you know, one of those guys is I know is Matt Bushman, who, who's now with Kansas City. And, uh, you know, I've talked to him on, on multiple occasions. And, and my message to him is always, listen, it's tough being on the back end of that tight end depth chart. But if you are, a lot of times the only way you make it is through special teams. And, you know, being in the NFL for so long, you, you kind of see a guy has a chance if he's a, a big contributor on special teams, if he's not, and he's on the back end of those depth charts, it's so difficult to make the 53 man roster. And uh, so I tell him, focus on that, be a beast on special teams. And, you know, you'll get your foot in the door that way. And then you can slowly over time, prove yourself as a tight end and, and uh, you know, start to increase your reps that way. But yeah, I mean, it's tough. Listen, you know, the NFL is um, it's a tough business, but you know, it's exciting to see all the Cougars that are out there, um, you know, doing big things in that league right now. It's, I, I think about there's a, several guys that fall into that category just mentioned, like Bushman, Sampson. Naku is trying to make the team as a wide receiver. He probably has to make his way onto that roster via special teams. And then you get a guy like Tyler Algier, who's, a, you know, a third-round draft pick. It, is it different for Tyler? He's a rookie, but, but his risk of getting cut as a third-rounder is a lot lower. Am I right? It's very different. Tyler's in a, in a totally different world than, than those guys on the bubble just trying to make the 53-man roster. I mean, Tyler's going to be on the roster. They've already invested enough in him just by drafting him in the third round that there's no way they're going to cut him. I mean, it has to be a complete disaster for him in, in OTAs and, and, and training camp for him to get cut as a third rounder. I mean, it, pretty much all the way up through the fifth round, you've got to really, really be bad and do some really bad things on and off the field to get yourself cut you know, come that time after training camp. So um, Tyler's in a great spot. I I'm hearing good things about him coming out of training camp and, and, 
you know, hopefully this preseason goes well for him and he stays healthy and he can, you know, get some, get some touches out there on the field. I think he's a guy who could really make an impact on his team right away. What, what about Danny Sorn? So Danny's in a unique situation. He's been a starter in the league and now it, you know, he, he's kind of getting a little bit further along in his career. He signs this new contract with a different team other than the, other than the chiefs. What kind of role do you see Danny? Cause Danny at first made it just as you described Dennis as a practice uh, team player and then on special teams and then as a starter in, a, in, in Super Bowls, right? So now it's a different part of his career. You know, what, what do you see for Danny this year? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Danny's going to still have to make his hay on special teams. You know, going to a new situation, I think it's always difficult, even as a veteran player. You're, you're in a new environment, new coaches. Um, yeah, they might have brought you in, but there's not the same, you know, type of early investment maybe as a guy who made the team as a special teamer and, you know, there with Andy Reid and kind of, you know, his BYU guy that he's kind of brought along. I think it's going to be a different situation for him. I still think he's going to have to be a beast on special teams, which by all accounts, you, you would you know, imagine he would be able to do because that's what he's done his whole career. Um, you know, even when he's a starter as a safety, you know, he was playing a lot of those special teams teams because he's valuable in, in that role. And um, a guy who can be a starter and still be a core special teams player Though there are few and far between of those guys in the NFL, and you love those kind of guys, and uh, so he he'll add value to any team he goes to just because he can do that, and he can give you added depth in the secondary as an experienced veteran. Whether he starts or not, I think you know he, he's going to make that roster. I, I'm I'm not even sure you know where his standing is on that team or what their depth chart looks like or any of that, but um, you know I, I think. It, I played for the Ravens and our coach was John Harbaugh prior mm -hmm. to being a head coach. He was a special teams coordinator for the Philadelphia Eagles. So special teams yeah. in our building was the first priority and they would bring guys in just to be special teams, core players, meaning you played on every special teams unit. And those were called the core players. And uh, you know, guys that had no chance of ever playing offensive defense, but they played every single special team and they were, you know, team leaders. They were, you know, guys that everybody respected. And they were looked at, you know, as just as valuable as, as starters on offense and defense because special teams was such a big priority in Baltimore by nature of our head coach and all these different things. But in the NFL especially, you know, I, I coached high school the last couple of years with, you know, Max and, mm -hmm. and Ty Detmer. And I don't think Max and Ty quite appreciate the value of special teams <laughs> like I do because I've been ingrained in it for so long in the NFL with, with Coach Harbaugh. And so I was always pushing those guys. We need more special teams time. We need more special teams time. I, I've just grown up in a system that values special teams so much. And so I understand that it can win you games and it can lose you games, um, you know, more so than, than most teams appreciate. And, uh, you know, I, long story short, Daniel Sorensen as a core player in special teams, the NFL more and more is understanding the importance of special teams players and good special teams players. I think as long as he can stay healthy, he's always got a place in this league as a guy like that. Dennis Pitt is on the Wise Guys tonight. Some of our streamers from around the world are asking questions. Here's one from Royal Coog. What is your thought on Taysom having a unique situation compared to other players? And then I might add, has Taysom called you and asked you how to play the tight end spot because now he's doing that with the Saints? Yeah, no, he, he has not reached out to me. <laughs> um, no, we haven't, we haven't really chatted about tight end, but Taysom's such a unique individual a unique player I, you know you see I think he fell into a really good situation um with, with New Orleans and you know Sean was able to do so many different things with him and so creative with him to really utilize his talents and because of that he found a place in the NFL now he'll forever be able to play that role and be that gadget player and be you know I, I guess he's a backup quarterback but you know he'll always be able to play that that tight end that kind of h-back role where you can come in and and run some you know, some speed option stuff out of the backfield as a quarterback and do so many different things for you and, and be kind of a uh, matchup nightmare for defenses. Because when you bring Taysom in the game, defenses want, want to understand your personnel because they want to match your personnel. I mean, that, there's so much of that in the NFL. So if you can roll two tight ends in the game, they want to match it with base personnel. If you have one tight end, a bunch of receivers, they want to match it with, you know, a nickel or a dime or something. They want to be able to match personnel for personnel. When Taysom's in the game, you don't know really what his role is. It's more difficult for defensive coordinators to match that personnel grouping. And so 
it just right away creates confusion. And then you line him up all over the field. You just don't know what you're going to get out of him. I think, you know, he, he plays such a fun role and he's really revolutionized the NFL in that respect, because there was never really a guy like that. Yeah. You know, Tim, Tab- Tim Tebow came in this league and, and he probably should have been used in more of a role like Taysom's being used, but he wasn't. They, there was just no creativity in Denver when they first brought him in and they just didn't use him in that role. And he could have been brought along a lot slower in that capacity, but you know, they, they weren't quite ready for that yet. Sean Payton was a revolutionary in the respect that he brought Taysom in. He saw something in Green Bay in just a few preseason games, brought him in and, and realized this guy's a great athlete. He can throw the ball, he can catch the ball, we can use him all over the field as just an offensive weapon and, you know, create a new position. And so, you know, Taysom Hill's a, an NFL star now without any real position type because of it. And so, you know, my hat's off to, to Taysom. He's worked hard. He's, he's stayed healthy, which I think was always, you know, his issue in college. But um, he's in a great situation, has carved out a really, really nice niche for himself in the NFL. And, uh, you know, maybe someday he'll reach out for me if he, if he moves to full-time <laughs> tight end, which I don't think he's – I don't think he's looking to do that. No, he doesn't. But, uh, he's number two. Yeah, he is number two. He's number two on the well. chart today. That's, yeah. Is that what he's listening They're, to? Well, yeah. And here's yeah. the thing. They, I mean, at first they said that's what they were going to do, and, and then they kind of backed off it and said, nah, you know what? We kind of need to play him all over the place. So, hey, what? what yeah, are, what, he might be listed at that. He's not going to play full time tight end. There's just yeah, no way. He's, no, he's too valuable all over the field. Hey, what? One of our boy. This is a hard question. I like what one of our uh, our followers just said. Uh, ask Dennis if he had to trade one or the other. So you, you, you can't have both. You can only have one. Your Super Bowl okay. ring or your win against Utah. What you trading in? What you giving up? <laughs> Uh, I have two wins against Utah, so I'll give up one of them. Oh, the Super Bowl nice, well played. <laughs> nice, hey, Dennis. When's the last? I, I'm t- assuming. Go ahead. When's the last time you put that Super Bowl ring on and just walked around the neighborhood? Be honest. Was it was it last night? No, I I never walked around the neighborhood. In it. <laughs> um, we actually had some friends over about a week ago, and I don't ever bring it out or even look at it until we have friends over that ask, "Hey, I want to see your Super Bowl ring," and we end up pulling it out, and I. You know, I end up staring at it quite a bit when I bring it out because it is pretty cool. But it doesn't really go um, with anything, though, right? It's, it doesn't go with a, a shirt, little, a suit. Yeah, it's a little gaudy, to be <laughs> honest. It's a little. It's not quite my style. It's it's pretty big, so I uh, I don't wear it out often uh, as an accessory. <laughs> but yeah, it's and listen, I, I'm not sure I'd give up that Super Bowl ring for for anything in my career. I mean, the wins against Utah were great, especially yeah. the last one, which I'm sure. Um, this question was referring to mm-hmm. when Andrew George right. caught it at the end, split, and we won in overtime. Um, I, I, I will say I'm always upset about that play because I was wide open on the right, and Andrew George was not open. He was no. covered. Max forced it but in. Max, Max forced it in there. The ball split <laughs> two defenders. Andrew catches it. They collide, and he's wide open. The, the right move there, the right throw was to me on the right side. Yeah, I wouldn't have scored, but I would have gotten a first down and got out of bounds, and we would have had a new set of downs. But I'm glad it happened the way it did. <laughs> I'm, pr- I'm, yeah. I'm Max I'm, did force I'm, it. I'm happy to be a part of that. Max wasn't afraid to force it in there, no, was he? No, not, no. not ever. I know. I, I tell him that all the time. He, he forced that throw. He knows it. <laughs> now, Max, Max is your brother-in-law. Um, when yeah. did the, when did he become your brother-in-law? Was it while you were in school? I'm trying to remember. Yeah, we um, we married into the same family, so mm-hmm. our wives are sisters. Um, I he got married uh, maybe his sophomore year. I got married my junior year. Did that give you more passes? Did you get was was there any kind of family benefit of well that's my brother in law I'm going to throw it to him more? Yeah, I don't know that I saw any more volume after <laughs> uh, after I made that move. I was hoping that it would. I yeah, that was a big you know motivation in, in getting that done early. But uh, I, I'm not sure it translated to on the field catches, <laughs> but. Um, you know, it didn't hurt. I'll tell you that. That's true. So we 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 started by by mentioning that you you came to BYU as a walk on, and I don't know yeah. that people really understand what what's that you know what that is like to come into a college program as a walk. I guess it's a little bit like these guys were talking about just scrapping and trying to make it on special teams in the NFL. What what was that experience like um, as a walk on, and then how how do you go from being a walk on to to, to be in one of the best that's ever played that position in the history of BYU? <laughs> uh, it's a good question. I, I'm i not sure how it went from point A to point B, to be completely honest. But, you know, I was a, I was a, a pretty good athlete in high school. I was a, you know, three-sport athlete, played basketball, football, and ran track. 
And uh, I was just real skinny in high school. And, you know, I didn't quite fill out. I was a little bit of a late bloomer. Um, I was young for my grade, so I graduated at 17. I just didn't quite develop at the same pace as a lot of the kids around me and, and as, you know, a lot of these high-priced recruits do. And so I kind of was, you know, under the radar a little bit as a skinny little wide receiver out of a small school in, in California. And um, I, I remember the recruiter in my area for um, BYU was Coach Lamb, which I, I know you guys know Coach Lamb. Sure. Well. He was a great guy. Um and, you know, he came over a couple times and, you know, the message was always, hey, we don't have a scholarship for you, but if you can get into school at BYU, because, you know, back then, you know, there wasn't a preferred walk-on designation where you could kind of get him in and, and, and do all that. If I was able to get into school at BYU academically, then, you know, they would let me come and walk on. So I wasn't a walk-on in the sense that I had to go try out for the team, um, but I was a walk-on in the sense that I had to apply to BYU on my own and get in academically yeah. before I ever had a chance to play football. So that's always my first message to kids. Like my career never would have started has, had I not been a good student in school. Now, fortunately I was, a, I was a good student. I was a 4.0 student in high school and I got into BYU uh, academically. So once I did, I was able to, to come out. I, I reached out to coach lamb and I said, Hey, I got into BYU. I'd love to come walk on. And uh, he said, great, go to this walk-on meeting and uh, they'll get you all squared away there. So I go to this walk-on meeting. I don't remember. I, I had enrolled in BYU in like 2003. Um, I go to this walk-on meeting. It's Coach Empey is, is running the meeting. And there's probably 50 kids in this meeting. And uh, a lot of them are trying out for the team and, and kind of getting some information about when tryouts are and all that. And uh, I'm sitting there and, and Coach Empey basically – uh, gives us all the message like, listen, if you're a lineman, you have a decent shot of making this team as a walk-on. <laughs> We're always looking for extra linemen and, uh, you know, on, on our scout teams and all that. If you're a skill position player, you pretty much have no shot. <laughs> and so I walk out of this meeting. That's and encouraging. I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm not very encouraged. I remember I called my dad right after this meeting. I said, hey, this is what he, they just told us. Like, I don't think I'm even going to get on this team. And so I, uh, long story short, I, I, I reach back out to coach lamb and he says, no, listen, just show up. Um, we'll get you set up, set away in the locker room. We, we want you here and all that. So I said, okay. And they, I, I forget how it all worked out. I ended up getting a locker in the old Smith field house. The, the actual team had just switched over to the SAB, the brand new. <laughs> and you were across the street. Yeah, they had, they had walk-ons over at the other building. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. So, so us lowly walk-ons, we were still in the Smith Field House in these ugly little metal locker rooms. Yeah. I had to work out in the Smith Field House. I couldn't work out in the new nice weight room with everybody else. Um, and there was a handful of us walk-ons. I remember Cale Buchanan. You know, the corner. Oh, yeah. Um, who ended up being a, a, a really good player and contributor and starter on the team. Him and I kind of came in together as these lowly walk-ons, and we were working out in the dark dungeon of the Smith Field House together. And it just didn't feel like we were part of the team at all. And it felt like we had no shot. Well, we started, we started um, doing player run practices, I think they were. This was, uh, this was like in – I had already been at school a semester – and this was like in, you know, they were, do, we were doing winter workouts and then player run practices. And so um, I'm going out there and somehow I got thrown in the mix as a wide receiver. I'm, I'm in John Beck's group mm -hmm. running plays and John's, you know, the, the slotted starter at the time. And um, I remember for whatever reason, I'm with John and I'm running go routes down the sideline. I caught two deep go routes and uh, you know, nobody knew who I was. Nobody knew my name. John came over after and said, hey, wh what was your name? And I told him Dennis and this and that. Well, anyways, John tells this story years later that after that practice, he went up and he met with Gary Croton, the head coach at the time. Yeah. And, and him and Gary would always meet after these play run practices and he would kind of go over how, you know, it went and how everybody looked and all that. And, and John told Gary in this, in this meeting, he said, hey, um, who looked – or Gary asked him who looked good today in practice. And John said, Hey, there was this new kid that looked pretty good. Uh, you know, tall rangy kid named Dennis. And Gary said, John, we have nobody on this roster oh, named Dennis. No. <laughs> nice. And John's like, that's weird. Cause he told me his name was Dennis. I don't know. <laughs> so they left it at that. And I don't think either of them thought 
you know, second longer about it. And, uh, and you know, long story short, I know I'm getting a little long way no, to the story, but we finally get into spring ball and, uh, they switched me to tight end. Uh, I, so now I'm working with coach. How, MP how, and all how much, how much and, do you weigh at that point, Dennis? I'm about 205. So 205 was, playing was, tight end. Yeah. Yeah. Six, five, 205. So I, I was, I was still in a wide receiver body and they switched me to tight end, which ended up being, you know, a, a good thing in the long run for me that I did switch to tight end. Um, but I'm going through spring ball and I started to make a couple of plays and, you know, doing well in one-on-ones and all that. And I remember after one one-on-one route, I went against Aaron Francisco and I think beat him on a little dig route. And, uh, coach Croton calls me over and I jog over to him and, and he says, Hey, Dustin, you're doing a really good job. <laughs> and I said, thanks coach. And I just jogged back by it. A- at least at this point, he associated a name with my face. And now, it began with D. And it began with D. At least it yeah, began with D. <laughs> so we're in the ballpark. You know, I'm making baby steps here. And uh, <laughs> that was kind of my start at BYU. Now, granted, I, I you know, started to do well in spring ball and, and ended up where I played that next fall as the number two tight end behind Dan Coates. And, and Dan got hurt late in the year. So I was, you know, really kind of the guy for the last couple of games of that season. Uh, you know, I was fortunate how it played out for me and worked out. Um, but it was an interesting rocky start early on as a walk. So how were you told, uh, how were you given a scholarship? How were you told, hey, Dennis, we, we want you here or, enough. Or did they where say, hey, Dustin. This is yours. Or Dustin. Or... <laughs> yeah, by the, time, by the time they offered me a scholarship, uh, I think they knew my name. I, I don't remember. The details are a little foggy. But um, I, I played that my freshman year um, in 2004 as a as a walk-on I was not a scholarship player and at the end of that year I was getting ready to leave on my mission and coach Croton uh called me in and he promised me that when I returned from my mission I would be on scholarship so right after that season now I left on my mission in 2005 right and coach Croton got fired in 2005 so I came back and it was Bronco Mendenhall and a whole new staff now fortunately Bronco Mendenhall was the defensive coordinator when I was there so there was some familiarity um with him and I, but, but there was still some unknown when I got off my mission, I didn't know if I had a scholarship because coach Croton had promised me it, but he was not the head coach. And, uh, I got back and reached out to, to actually Barry Lamb again, who was, you know, still on the staff. And, uh, they assured me that I would, I would be able to come back and, and they would honor that scholarship. So that's how it kind of worked out, um, before and after my mission. Well, now you start a run after your mission of 32 wins in 39 games, 11 and 2 in 07, 10 and 3 in 08, 11 and 2 in 09. Along the way, you catch 221 passes and 21 touchdowns. What was it between you and Max that just seemed to work so well in that offense? Yeah, it's a good question. I think for, first, we had a great offensive system. Um, when I left in 05, it was Gary Croton and, and kind of his offense, and it wasn't, wasn't quite tailor made for a lot of catches for a tight end. Um, you had your hand in the dirt a lot. It was more pro style. Um, I don't know that I would have had the same level of production had he remained the head coach and that offensive system had remained the same. So I, I think Bronco taking over and bringing in coach and I was a huge blessing for me coming back and being able to play in that system because I was flexed out a lot. I got to play in the slot, which really suited as a former wide receiver, really suited my abilities. Um, you know, I wasn't a guy who wanted his hand in the dirt very much. And I wasn't a guy who, uh, you know, liked banging heads at the line of scrimmage. I wanted to be split out and I wanted to run routes and, and, and catch the football. So, um, in that regard, it was a perfect system for me and a great fit for my skill set. And, and then having a guy like Max, who's, you know, just the winningest quarterback in BYU history, right. mm-hmm. um, that helps. It, it certainly helps. And having a guy like Austin Colley on the outside, we came home from our missions at the same time. And uh, got to play all those years together. And, and, you know, Harvey in the backfield. I mean, just just the group that we had helped us all be successful. It, it's tough when you don't have help on the outsides as a tight end because they can key on you and, and vice versa. If you don't have, you know, guys all over the field that they have to play more honest against you, um, it, it makes it a little more difficult. And so um, I, I just think the timing was right for me to be able to you know, put up the stats and, and have the success that I had and uh had the right guys around me in the right system and all that so I, i'm just you know feel fortunate and blessed to kind of have played in that era and uh been able to do what i did you know max when we had max with us a couple weeks ago uh he talked about that same thing 
about the fact that he just loved that he would come up to the line of scrimmage and just go, yeah, who do they think they're going to single up this time? Because that's who I'm throwing the ball to. And so, and so eventually people just started to play you guys straight up because doubling Austin on the outside meant you were one-on-one. Doubling you on the inside and bracketing you meant Austin was one-on-one. Uh, trying to bracket both of you meant that Harvey could come out of the backfield or he just run the ball downhill at him. And he said, man, what a, what a great group. So that was, that was a great time with, with tremendous talent. One, one of our followers asked, um, both, both you and Austin go into the NFL and have unbelievably promising starts to your NFL careers – and, and both shortened by injuries, you know, both on pro, really, I, I feel like multiple year Pro Bowl trajectories for, for both of you guys. How, how did you manage that mentally? Because you had multiple injuries as you were there in the NFL. And Austin had to deal with the same thing. Yeah, it's, it's tough. I mean, Austin's, you know, one of my best friends. And to kind of have a similar path in the NFL uh, is, is unusual, I guess. Listen, the NFL, I mean, football in general, you, you guys know, it's it's just, it's a dangerous sport. Yeah. Injuries are always part of it. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, both of us, you know, became, you know, subject to, to just a, a litany of injuries. And sometimes you get unlucky. Sometimes, you know, it's just, I, I don't exactly know. I mean, Austin, you know, he, what started to kind of derail his his stuff was all the concussions yeah. and uh you know, I it was difficult to to be in Baltimore and watch him having to go through that. And we we would talk on the phone constantly, you know, every week. And um, you know, have, seeing him because because he went through that before I started going through my stuff. And uh, I just saw how difficult it was for him because he got off to an unbelievable start. I mean, he was playing with Peyton Manning and, and Reggie Wayne and all those guys, and he was a a key contributor mm-hmm. and, and an important cog to to their offense success. You know, they went to a Super Bowl. They they were they just had a great team over there, and to see his career get derailed the way it did because of concussions and all that, um, that that was tough. You know, you don't want to see your friend go through that. And then, of course, he starts going through that, and and I have just kind of a freak hip injury in training camp one year. Um, it was going into my going into my fourth year, right off the Super Bowl. Um, we won the Super Bowl in 2013, and going into that offseason or into training camp, I. I go up for a ball in the back of the end zone and um, the safety is trying to play me high. I grab it. I'm coming down with it. And the linebackers underneath me and pins my legs as I'm landing. And with the weight of the safety and then me coming down on my knee, it just popped my hip right off the back. I mean, it's just, you see that kind of an injury in car accidents a lot because your knees get jammed up and, and, and pop out the back. Um, a posterior dislocation is what they call it. And, you don't see it a lot in football. Um, you know, it's usually when your legs kind of get pinned behind you and something crazy happens, you get tackled. I mean, you saw it with Bo Jackson. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Bo Jackson, one of the greatest athletes to ever play, got pinned from behind, his legs pinned out, his hip sublexes, and, and, you know, it just creates problems for the rest of his career. He had to get a hip replacement because he got uh, avascular necrosis. Blaine, you know what I'm talking about oh, yeah. in this world a little bit. Yep, uh, I've been, probably, I've been, I've I'm been probably in wearing the- one of your – I probably got one of your products inside me right now. You better have one of mine. We'll we'll talk. I hope off, it works. We'll talk offline. But yeah, no, I, yeah. I've been in the OR to see a lot of all of these things you're talking about to to be in there to help fix those over over the years. But yeah, just 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 crazy. But and and the good good news for you is before the hip injuries and kind of the winding down seven seven seasons in the NFL, but you got to play in a Super Bowl and you got to catch a touchdown pass in a Super Bowl and you got to be a major contributor on a Super Bowl team. Um, many, many folks play years and years and years and never have that opportunity. What was that like? Yeah, I mean, listen, you know, we're talking a lot about the, the frustrating parts of the injuries and all that and the things that kind of derail the trajectory of, of my career and Austin's career and all that. And, um, you know, I look back and there's a lot of, there's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of, not necessarily anger, but, but, you know, some, some difficulty when you're thinking about, oh, I could have done this and I could have done that. But in my situation, I also feel incredibly grateful and blessed that I was able to win a Super Bowl and accomplish all the things that I was able to accomplish before injuries just kind of started to mount up and, and became too much. And, you know, after, after my first hip dislocation, you know, I was able to come back that season and, and then just every other, I, I dislocated it two more times, you know, over the, over the course of the next four years. And uh, they were just byproducts of the first one. After, after the first one, you know, 
you, the blood flow just quite isn't the same and, and it just, it creates a weaker hip and all that kind of stuff. And so I was fortunate to continue to get cleared by doctors, which I'm not sure I should have, um, to continue to play and, and prolong my career. But, um, yeah, I mean, it just was kind of a, a difficult litany of injuries, just hip related injuries after that. And so, um, but I look back with, like you mentioned, with, with a ton of gratitude. I mean, there's not a lot of guys that get to play in a Super Bowl, much less, less win one and have a ring and, and, and be able to do all that. And we actually have our, uh, our 10 year reunion for the Super Bowl coming up this, this year. And so, um, we're all flying out to Baltimore and, and they're, you know, doing a whole weekend for our, our Super Bowl team in That's Baltimore great. and, uh, and going to be out there at the game. And so, um, being a part of a team like that, where you're able to win one, um, you know, in, in like you mentioned earlier, in, in the biggest game of any of our lives, is, is pretty special to look back on and, and have been a part of. And and I always joke with Austin. You know, he went to a Super Bowl, but he lost. <laughs> and there's nothing worse. He'll he'll tell you there's nothing worse than going that far all the way to the Super Bowl and deal with all that you have to deal with the pressure, the just all the the nonsense outside of football, all the media attention. It's a tough two weeks from the AFC championship game or NFC championship game until you get to the Super Bowl. There's just, you know, there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of, you know, I got to get tickets for this person, and this person, I got to do this. I got to interview this media is everywhere. It's a very stressful two weeks and you go in that game. It's a lot easier when you win that thing. It's really difficult to swallow having gone through all that and, and prolonged your season for six more weeks than everybody else who's at home resting for nothing and having to go home <laughs> a, a loser and not have a Super Bowl ring to show for it. So, I'll always hang that over Austin's head for sure. Yes. But um, hey, you is, is he our first? That, that the one I played and I won. Is Dennis our first world champion on the show? I'm trying um, to think, we, we have. Well, Wilson had two Super Bowl. Yeah, rings. He, that's right. So, so Mark, Mark has. A but couple. he didn't catch a touchdown. No, but he held. He held. He did hold for He it. was in the game. He was hurt. And uh, was he, he told. A, was he a holder for yeah. the? Well, not. Well, he was. He he told the funniest story last last week. He was on the. The, um, he wasn't on the active list because he was hurt. Broke his shoulder. He broke his shoulder. And their oh, kicker, wow. Chris Barr, marches into the head coach's office and says, and I, think about this. He says, in this Super Bowl, you need to activate Mark Wilson because since he's not been holding, I can't kick, and I will not have Ray Guy hold another kick. <laughs> so the greatest punter <laughs> in the history of the game got demoted from holding, yeah. even though he was still punting, so that Mark could come in and hold – in, in the Super Bowl for par, for bar. <laughs> well, listen, I, I, I've been around, you know, I've been around a lot of kickers. You guys know they're, they're, they're weird individuals. <laughs> they, they need everything. Oh yeah. It's gotta you know, be in perfect the right, in the right place. And it's gotta be perfect. <laughs> and they're, they're just a sensitive group. I mean, I played with Justin Tucker my whole career. Oh before. man. Yeah. You, know, you could say he's maybe the greatest kicker yeah. of all time. Yes. And, uh, you know, he's an, he's an oddball. He's they're, a weird dude. We, we're just going to say they're, you, dude, so. they're all unique individuals, are they not? Yes. They are very unique. So how yeah. often do you point out to Austin that um, he had 215 spectacular receptions at BYU and you had 221? <laughs> well, I did do it in one more year. So Austin... Uh, you can leave some of those details you to, out. You don't have to yeah, say anything I about know. that. I, I, I want to be as candid as possible in this interview. <laughs> I don't want ever, I don't want to deceive everybody. I, I played another year, but I will say this. When I was a freshman, we were both freshmen together with Gary Crowden. I mean, that kid caught like 80 balls. I mean, how many balls did he catch his freshman <laughs> I year? I can't it was remember. Amazing. That but offense you're right. was, was yeah. just chucking balls up deep to the outside guys, left and right. I mean, we weren't getting any love on the inside as tight ends. So I have that I had to deal with. Yeah. You know, he was in a system that he was able to flourish on the outside. I mean, had he been in Gary's system for – Four oh, years, he probably would have set every yeah. every collegiate record there is yeah. for receiving. I mean, they were just chucking balls up deep to Todd Watkins and Austin on either side and and <laughs> yeah. making hay. So we hey. were doing all the dirty work on the inside, getting those guys open. What one one of our uh, our followers uh, asked? They said, "Hey, that team with when we, had, we were talking about how the weapons with with uh, with Harvey and with you and with Austin and that team was pretty good defensively as well." Um, they asked, "Would that team win a Big Twelve title if that team was in the Big 12? Um, could could that BYU team have won a Big 12 title? Because people are wondering, can BYU compete in this new league? What do you think? That team you were on, could you have gone out and won a Big 12 title? Granted, you beat Oklahoma. Uh, I think that, well, uh, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, we, we, we would we beat Oklahoma, which would have been the first step in, in the right direction <laughs> yeah, right. winning the Big 12. 
Um, granted, we we probably needed Sam Bradford to be injured in that game to pull that one. Yes, um, it, it helped that you know Colby Clawson hurt him early in that game, and we got Jarvis. No, not Jarvis Landry, the other Landry, right? Yeah, the lesser known Landry um, to come in, and we got some help in that game. But we played. Listen, we played. We played well, and we we took it to him. Uh, we would have had a shot. I, I listen. I think it would have been difficult, you know, playing that tough of a schedule. I mean, I, Texas back then. Uh, maybe in the Big 12 now, Texas back then with Colt McCoy, I mean, they were a juggernaut. Because um, Colt came out in 2010 with, with me. We were in the same draft class, so we would have had to play against Colt and, and those really good Texas teams. And um, <laughs> Back then, I, I will say no. I don't think we had a shot in the Big 12 with, with Oklahoma and Texas. Yeah. Because they were really good back then. I mean, Oklahoma still, you know, and the Lincoln Valley's yeah. been really good, but they were both. Oklahoma's, what, number three in the country, number two in the country when we played them that year, and then Texas might have gone to the national championship that year, to be completely honest, or the year before, because I know Colt played in the national championship. So if I'm being realistic, no. Maybe this, maybe, you know, in present day we would have had a shot. Yeah. With, right. with no Lincoln Riley in Oklahoma, they would you know, who knows? They they don't play any defense over there, so we would have put up a lot of points. <laughs> that league's changed. That back when you were playing that league played defense. Now nobody plays defense in that league. Oh, I know. I know. Oh, well, I'll the take Big that back. Is not they, a defensive league. Baylor plays solid defense. They played good defense. They, they kind of changed the narrative and, and yeah. played good defense last. You know, they have a defensive head coach, but the rest of the league doesn't play defense. <laughs> no, they, I know. Not, none at all. I mean, they're, they're just giving up points. So, Dennis. We would have had a chop. We would have had a chance. Yeah. So, you're rolling along, and then uh, this uh, you have a huddle. And you're in there, and Austin's in there, and Max is in there. We're talking Oklahoma now. Yeah. Or no, any game. Or just any game. Uh, so yeah. take us in that huddle. Who's talking? Who's saying the most during these <laughs> moments? What's being said? And are you saying, hey, look, Max, I'm open. And, and I was, what's going on in the huddle with you guys? No, I didn't say a lot. Austin was the one always saying, hey, I'm wide open. you got to <laughs> throw me the ball. Uh, Austin can, was, was always tripping that. at Max. You know, he's he's the that. diva, number one wide receiver. Um, th- those guys are a special breed and, uh, he was always, he was always talking. Max was, I think more preoccupied with yelling at the defense. You know, he was always saying something to them. <laughs> um, Harvey was pretty quiet. Harvey wasn't saying a lot. I was kind of keeping it myself. Uh, that's the quietest, that's you know, the quietest huddle of, yeah, of all man, time. We yeah, thought you guys would be in there. Harvey, Harvey really didn't. I, I can't, I don't remember Harvey saying a lot, you know, Harvey's kind of a, a quieter guy. I, I've never been the type to come in a huddle and demand the ball. Yeah. You know, I might've been just making jokes to guys in the huddle, but I'm not sure I would have been, uh, Hey, Har- I would have been demanding the ball from anybody. But Dennis Harvey told, like we get all kinds of stories. Mark Wilson told us a story that he said he's been holding inside for 40 years on last week about how he went in, <laughs> he went in and told Lavelle Edwards he quit. Yeah. He was done before, like right? before he went out and was a first round draft pick the next year, he quit and Lavelle told him don't quit. And got and got the coach that they all wanted back, and he stayed. And then they were phenomenal the next year. Like he'd never well, told so that. Why, why does he say? Why does he say he wanted to quit? They. So what happened was Doug Scoville left and went to the NFL, and Lavelle brought another coordinator in that decided he wasn't going to run Doug Scoville's offense. They completely changed the offense. He and Jim McMahon alternated. They only won nine games, which back yeah. in those days was horrific. If you don't win 11 at BYU back in those days, you're terrible, right? And everybody was unhappy. Yeah. And I guess 20-some players had gone in and told Lavelle, we're out. We don't like football anymore. And Mark told Lavelle, I'm done. I'm just going to go to law school. And Lavelle said, give me a month or so. Just don't make a rash decision and give me a minute. Then they had a team meeting, and he said, I want to introduce you guys to somebody. And he went and convinced Doug Scoville to come back from the NFL and he said, I want to introduce you to Doug Scoville, our offensive coordinator, who's back. And they all stayed. And then they went on and, uh, you know, were a top five team the next year. Mark was a top 10 draft pick in the NFL draft. And, and, you know, and, and, then, and then Jim played the next year and broke 76 NCAA records. But So he told us that story. Harvey told us the story that when he ran for that touchdown in the Utah game um, after the, the fourth and forever – that yeah. he was actually turning around to throw the football at the safety that he ran over on the on the uh, on the goal line <laughs> and he says nobody knows this but if if Sete doesn't come over was it Sete yeah i think it was who was it that, that one ran of the in? linemen? Yeah, one of the linemen ran over to hug him, and he hit the lineman instead of the other player and he goes that saved <laughs> us a 15 yard penalty and we needed the extra point to to get up by 7 he goes so that saved us a 15 yard penalty so so what story 
has been deep down inside of you that you've never told? Because people come on the show, Dennis, and they just bare their soul. It's like uh, it's like we're two Barbara Walters yeah, sitting like, here. It is, just is, is there yeah. some story that nobody knows? You're like, I, I really shouldn't tell this, but you want to tell us tonight. <laughs> No, I mean, people are way too comfortable with you two. I, <laughs> I don't know why that is. I mean, maybe you got kind of some moody lighting in your basement there, and it's, you know, <laughs> we feel like we're just you know, a, having a psychiatrist appointment. We're sometimes. On the couch and just telling our deepest, darkest secrets. I don't have a story like that. There's nothing I have kept bottled up for any amount of time. All right, well, then tell this story. Uh, we okay. won't create a story for okay. you. Okay, well, yeah. It's second quarter in the Super Bowl. You're at the one-yard line. Yes. And you're going about. You're gonna catch your touchdown. Um, and granted, it was a one-yard touchdown. But every kid that's ever played football dreams about catching a touchdown in the Super Bowl. What was that play like? And once you secured the ball and you knew you were across the line, what'd that feel like? Yeah, I mean, in the moment, you have none of those thoughts. Really? I mean, I... You don't. And, uh, you know, we were running a play. I was running a corner route on that play. And I'm, I'm the down tight end on the right side. You know, we're on the one-yard line, so we're in a heavy personnel. We've got three tight ends on the field. And uh, I'm kind of faking like I think I'm – if I remember right, I'm, I'm kind of taking a step down inside like I'm blocking down, and then I slip out, and I'm, I'm supposed to run a corner route. Um, and, I, and I do that, and I come out to run my corner route, and, and Dante Whitner – uh, is already out there, and he has a beat on it. And he knows I'm running a corner route, and he's got outside leverage on me. So there's no way I'm getting outside of him to run a corner route. So I, I kind of run into him and push him a couple steps, and then I snap my corner route, out, uh, route off, and I just turn around and I look back right at Joe. And Joe kind of does a little hand fake, and he's kind of has a mini roll to the side, and he sees it. And I mean, never have I stopped running a corner route in my whole career like I did in the Super Bowl. And for whatever reason, I just knew I was not going to get outside. And I knew I needed to give Joe a throw right away. So I kind of pushed him a couple steps outside, threw him by and just sat down. And sure enough, right when I did that, Joe was on the same page and he fired it to me right in, right in between the numbers. And I caught it and we, we ended up scoring a touchdown. So it's just one of those weird plays where it's not how you scripted it at all i mean we ran it a million times in practice and i was always running i was catching in the corner of the end zone tiptoeing out of bounds um near the pylon and it was just in that moment he knew i had bad leverage i knew i had bad leverage and we were both on the same page where i just was at that point it's street ball i'm just trying to get open and i throw him by and i flip around and we're on the same page and we catch we catch a ball and i think that's a tribute to a couple things number one you know, just trusting one another. I just knew Joe would kind of read my body language and, and be able to fire the ball in there um, and know what I was doing. And, uh, you know, and just kind of having a chemistry with the guy. I mean, Joe and I are, you know, best friends off the field and, and still are. And so we, we've th thrown a million balls together. And, and I'm sure at some point we've talked about something similar to that, like, hey, if this guy's overplaying it, throw him by and set up and, We've never repped it, but it happened in the biggest game of both of our careers, and it, and it worked out. And so uh, I, I caught that pass, and as customary in the Super Bowl, usually if you catch a touchdown pass, you kind of hold on to the ball and you run it you to the sideline. Yeah, 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 and you hand it to you know your equipment manager, and he puts it in a chest. He writes your, write name your name on, on it and puts it. Yeah, yeah. And I thought of none of that in the moment, <laughs> and you know I catch a touchdown pass, and I. The first thing I do is I throw the ball down. I don't know where that ball ended up. Oh no! And come on, I run over. I run over, and one of our linemen are right there, and he lifts me up, and and you know I'm celebrating. I get to the side, and they're like, "Where's your ball?" <laughs> and I'm like, "I have no clue." Oh. And so they they ended up tracking it down, but oh, I, but I you know, and so I have a, a that ball now, and it's got an inscription on the side and all That's that, so which cool. the team does for you, and so. It that's really cool to be able to look back at that and all that. But like in, in the moment, like I said, at the beginning, none of that goes through your mind. Even after catching a touchdown pass, I'm not thinking like, this is the coolest moment of my life. I'm keeping this ball. I'm running back, put this away. I mean, I, it's just another football game. And yeah, you're excited because that, I think we went up by, that was the second touchdown of the game. So we went up 14 zero at that point. And you know, you go 14 zero early in the game. I mean, you're, you're feeling good about things. 
And, uh, you know, we were, we were living good at that moment. And, uh, see, that's what separates and, you from me and Blaine. We, we would have probably just run up into the stands. Yep. Our night was over. I would have touched fans, down. I would have been done. You were actually focused on but winning you, the game. When, when you t- describe that, Dennis, though, I, so many times we're interviewing coaches and they go, well, you know, on that play, players just make plays. That's what I like. Players, playmakers just make plays. That's exactly what they're describing. Playmakers just, that's not how the play was designed. But you got to have guys that just make plays, and that's what you and Joe did on that play. Yeah, I, I mean, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, at, at some point, you got to just, you know, trust your instincts out there. Now, you can't do that on every play, but on the one yard line when windows are tight and you know you got to make a play and your quarterback doesn't have much time. And I mean, yeah, we were just making a play, to be completely honest. I mean, I, I don't know what went through my head in that moment, but I just knew if I stayed on the corner route, I wasn't getting the ball. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get open and, and, uh, you know, I think we had a flat route underneath by, by another tight end. And so if, if, and that was well covered, if I'm not, if I'm not getting open on this corner route, um, you know, Joe maybe tries to run and probably loses three yards. So listen, uh, you know, yeah, what the Seahawks, yeah, we're just, we're just out there playing ball and trying to have some fun. What the Seahawks wouldn't do. No, the Seahawks, able to get a the, the Seahawks are like, no, that was just as bad as the Michael Jordan play. Dennis pushed off. That's the definition That's of offensive it. pass interference. Right? That's make. what the Seahawks are saying. But who cares about yeah. that? This is it was about the Ravens. That's I mean, listen, that's that's a crazy play. Like, everybody says, yeah, you should have handed off to Marshawn Lynch, <laughs> which, by all accounts, I probably would have done the way that he was running downhill and, and they were just, you know, gashing him for big it's, runs after big runs. But it's, it's so hard, though. I mean, like, you, people don't tr- understand. You think the situation a little bit. Yeah, as yeah. a coach, you're saying, okay, we've ran it, you know, five straight times down their throat. They're going to – we're on the one-yard line. They're going to really beef up. And, you know, last thing you want to do is get our momentum stopped here. Let's, let's throw a little change up in. It's a safe little pick play. How many times has a pick play, the guy coming underneath, ever been jumped like that right. and gotten intercepted? I mean, it's never happened. We've run a million pick plays like that. The underneath guy on a little slant, a one-yard slant, that never gets jumped and picked. And, and of course, it did for whatever reason. Yeah. The, the receiver, I think, faded back a little bit, and, and the defender, you know, Butler jumped it unbelievably well but it just it, that was such a freak thing and of well course, and people everybody's gonna people are always like why don't you just, it. why don't you just hand it off to it's not in the nfl not even in college football people are like why can't you just run it on the one yard line and get it in it's not that easy to no. run it down there when you put d linemen in every gap you play a gap six down there in the goal line it's not that easy to run it down there, and sometimes you've got to do something a little bit different. And, well, I think tonight we've play. had an accounting of the yes, single yeah. greatest one-yard pass in the I history of the it. Super Bowl. And, and you know what, Dennis? <laughs> the way you the way you described it, we have um, uh, one of our guys, Rob Yuki, says that's a great description. I, like you can virtually see what what Dennis went through to score. It's really cool, and so I, I we love that. That's awesome. That's awesome. Dennis, we got, uh, we're going to hit you up with five really quick questions from um, our okay. social media gurus. But before we get to that, let's finish with one meaty question of, of uh, in this tight end business at BYU, there's Isaac Rex, and we saw him out on the field yesterday. Right. He's looking better. Back His ankle's that. looking like he's back. Dallin Holker, who you – I wrote a story earlier in the summer. You had a lot of good things to say about Holker because he reminds us of you and, and how you – how. Uh, how you played the game. Uh, these two guys, what do you expect from the tight ends this fall with the schedule BYU has coming up? Yeah, I, I think you have to love these two tight ends. You really do. I mean, you guys mentioned uh, Holker. And, and yeah, I, I would agree with you. I think he reminds me a lot of me just in the style of play. You know, he, he's kind of more of a wide receiver type body, which I was. You know, we talked earlier about that. And, um, you know, they flex him out a lot and he, he can really run and, uh, he, he just is a difficult matchup for a linebacker to go cover him or a safety to cover him. I mean, you really have to treat him more like a, an inside receiver than anything. And, um, and then you have Isaac, which, you know, Isaac just burst onto the scene his yeah. freshman year and you realized how valuable Isaac is in the red zone. Mm-hmm. And I know the production wasn't there last year for either of those guys and Isaac had that horrific injury and, right. and, you know, it's great to hear that, that he's looking pretty good in camp and is he full go now? He's Sorry, li- he's got limited, limited pitch count. So like, it's like, he's okay. They expect him to be full go by the first game, but there he's, 
He's limited pitch count, much like Puka was last fall. We're like, okay, this practice, he can only have this many plays. Next practice, he can have... So what they're doing is they're weaning yeah. him back in so that week of the game, he gets full... For, first game, he's getting full reps, and he can go full go in the game. That's the plan for him. And he looks pretty good in his limited reps. Yeah, well, that's, that's good to hear. I, I've, I've really become good friends with Byron Rex, his yeah. dad, over the last you know year or so, and... Uh, uh, actually played in a golf tournament, John Beck and I, and, and Byron and all them, we were out there and, and chatted for hours, you know, about Isaac and, and everything BYU football. And, and, uh, so I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Isaac. I'm a huge fan of, of Dallin. Both those guys are tremendously talented. And, and what's cool about their tight end room right now is, is they both have very different skill sets in my opinion. <clears throat> like I mentioned, Isaac is a huge body. Um, he can be a force at the line of scrimmage. He's a matchup nightmare in the red zone. I mean, you can throw it up to him. He can go up and make tough contested catches, which I think is so valuable uh, as a tight end. Because when those windows get tight and you get into that red zone, you have to have a reliable guy that you can, you know, throw it up to and and you know he'll make a play. And Isaac's proven to be able to do that from his freshman year with with, uh, Zach at the helm to last year before his injury. And so you couple that with now Down's ability to really stretch the field vertically yeah. And, uh, you know, really run and, and, and create some mismatches in the pass game. I, I just I think they complement each other exceptionally well. They're both awesome kids. I mean, I've, I've had contact with both of them and uh, they have both reached out to me um, for help and, and some guidance. And so I, I'm looking forward to be able to to talk more with them as the season progresses and, uh, you know, help them in any way that I can. And and they have the right you know work ethic. And they, they have the right mindset and I'm, you know, nobody's a bigger fan of those two guys than I am right now. And I hope that they catch a ton of balls this year and we can find a way offensively because I think where we've fallen short offensively the last couple of years and last year in particular is they haven't found a way to really get the tight end as involved as we would like to see with two talented guys like that. Now I know we have a ton of talented guys on the outside with Puka and, 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 uh, um, at Gunnar Romney and, yeah. and all those guys. I know there's a ton of talent out there, but but when you have talented tight ends, you have to find a way to get those guys the ball. Every good offense in the NFL understands that and is looking for a tight end that can create mismatches on the inside. And uh, if you have that, you've got to utilize it. And so I, I hope that that's the step this year that they take offensively that they didn't quite have last year because that will take Jaron and this whole offense to a whole nother level. If they can dice people up, inside the hashes and also be able to throw bombs and, and outside stuff to those talented wide receivers. So I'm looking forward to this season. And, and, you know, from all accounts, it sounds like, you know, Downs having a, a great camp and hopefully those guys stay healthy and, yeah. and yeah, uh, Downs and looking really big, have big years. Downs looking bigger and, and more physical. Uh, here's, here's some good news for you. I, I was w- watching from up above yesterday just cause I wanted to see, kind of see it better. So I went up on the balcony to watch him and uh, I, after a bunch of throws, I just said, Hey, is it, I asked, I asked Spencer next to me, I said, is it just me or does it seem like Jaron seeing the middle of the field a little bit better? And think about it. The, the further along you get as a quarterback, the inside of the field's hard to see with all those big dudes in there. You know, you have to see the field through windows and all that. And it's just easier to see the outside of the field. And his, in his maturation process, I feel like that's a step he's going to take. And that's going to get the tight ends back more involved in the offense with, with him, and, and, you know, that was one practice yesterday, but I also thought at the, the first practice, I thought, wait a minute here. Like, the, the ball's going to the inside a lot more, so I think your wish is going to come true and those tight ends are going to catch more balls this year, Dennis. Well, and, and that's a great point, Blaine. I, I always say this. I always say uh, uh, what separates a good quarterback from a great quarterback is the ability to throw in the middle of the field. Because you look at the Tom Brady's of, of the world, you know, and, 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 you know, I know Tom Brady is the greatest quarterback of all time, but, but you look what he did – throughout his time in new England, he took Gronkowski and, and at the time, Aaron Hernandez, and you know, whoever was that tight end. And those guys, they would just dice people up, up the seams, you know, in all these different creative ways, but it's because Tom was so good at knowing what he had in the middle of the field, because if you can kill people at the seams, you can just really create headaches for defenses. Yep. And, and like you said, young quarterbacks, typically because it's, it's easier to read. It's easier to see. There's usually only one or two guys you have to locate to be able to throw to the outside, comebacks, go routes, all that kind of stuff. That's an easier read for quarterbacks. A quarterback that can dice you up in the middle of the field and take, 
when it's, you know, those easy ones on the outside when they're given, that's a dangerous quarterback. And so if Jaron's able to do that this year, which, you know, it sounds like he is, he's going to really take a huge step in his maturation because that, that, in my opinion, is always what the mark of a great quarterback is, being able to kill people in between the hashes. Fantastic insight from the great Dennis Pitta, basketball coach Mark Pope's on deck here on The Wise Guys. Now, inspired by uh, CEO of Gig, social media guru Scott Warner, we've got five questions for you. You ready? These are rapid I'm fire. Ready. Rapid fire five questions. This is how we get to know you, right? So okay. we're going to start off. Number one, favorite sports movie? Oh, man. Uh... I love Remember the Titans. Amen. Right. Amen. That's mine. That's a good one. Remember That's a good team. one. All right. Favorite band or singer? Oh, man. I, uh, you know, I have become a huge country person lately. That's all right. That's okay. Like, That's okay. Dave's hard rock. We've all I'm softened up. Your country no, is all good. No, I'm, not asking, I'm not asking for an apology. I'm saying country's awesome. <laughs> okay. You don't have to say it's okay. It I felt like you were kind of no, asking. I, to, the way you no. said it. The way you said it. No, yeah. Okay. <laughs> what I meant is I haven't always been a country fan, but over the last year or so, I have been a big country fan. We went to Garth Brooks, you know, concert a couple of years ago, and it was just, it just launched me into this whole country right. deal. And so a- anything country. Anything country. Anything There's not country. One favorite guy, that, an like entire category. Not Tim McGraw or Keith Garth Urban. Brooks or Keith Urban or. Yeah, they're all. Oh, they're, they're all, all really awesome. Good. Okay. Anything yeah, country. They're all good. Well, I hope we you don't. We recently, I'll, I'll say this. I'll, I'll narrow it down. Kane Brown has been a favorite right. of mine over the last couple months. We All went right. to his concert recently. Nice. And, and I'm not even a concert person. I don't prefer to be in massive crowds like that, but I, uh, I love that. We're one. putting Kane Brown Kane down. Kane Brown is your guy. Okay. Favorite breakfast, ahead, favorite, favorite breakfast cereal. Oh, man. I mean, I've all, traditionally, I've been a Cinnamon Toast Crunch guy, but I, I've actually converted to golden grams now golden i say grams. this this I is a whole new dentist saying, i don't what, i don't golden grams what are you a grandfather cereal. what's going on here i know w- when my eating is completely <laughs> off track and i know i'm hitting rock bottom i'm eating cereal at night that's, and that's, that's i know i'm off track when you're I'm not eating. alone i never yeah. eat that's i don't me. ever eat breakfast so i don't ever eat cereal in the morning but i know i love cereal okay and if i'm eating cereal at night like late at night watching TV, I know I've hit rock bottom. So that's a good indicator. <laughs> you, and you've you, hit you, rock bottom you, with Golden you, Grams. You'd get, he'd get along with yeah, Scott Yeah, and Warner it would be with great. Golden Grams. Okay. So gold, hey, Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Um, or a, a lot of people. Actually, a lot oh, of people. If you can get past, if you get past the razor blades at the beginning of eating <laughs> O's, <laughs> O's are very good. <laughs> that's awesome. So okay, next one. You're up, Dave. Uh, which player hit you the hardest in the NFL? Um, Gerard Mayo. From sure. the New England Patriots in the AFC Championship game, the year we went to the Super Bowl, you can look it up. It's a pretty vicious hit. It's all over the internet, and uh, I think there's even a GIF oh my that gosh. Uh, has that. Really? Okay. Okay, we're looking we'll at look that. Up. Hey, you're, so you're, that's, you're, uh, you're, 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 <laughs> your old BYU uh, um, brother in arms, Chad Lewis, immediately without hesitation said Ray Lewis. We're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Ray was, as soon as he goes well, Ray Lewis fortunately Dave, Ray and I were on the same team yeah, exactly. that works. You, don't, you don't hit that viciously in practice I no mean, no I've blocked him plenty of times but I've never gotten totally blindside wiped out by him like it's, I did it's yeah. just so funny as soon as, as soon as Chad like no hesitation he's like ah Ray Lewis Dave and I look at each other and go yeah <laughs> that makes sense so Okay, Fa- <laughs> yeah. favorite BYU tight end of all time. Oh, look, we're not- going to show this. Oh, we're going to show that. We, we pulled this- it up on YouTube. Is this the hit right and, now? Uh, oh, my goodness. We're watch- can you see that, middle. Dennis? Oh, oh, Dennis. My. I can't see it. Oh, I, thank- I can't see it, but I know it well. I've seen it a lot. <laughs> I lived through it. Listen, so hey, those I, listening I'm, to the I'm podcast. A route here. Yeah. Yeah. Let me explain this play a little bit because <laughs> I need to set this up for you guys. So I, I'm running a shallow route. My, my main responsibility on this route concept is to grab the linebacker and pull him out of the window for a little again another offensive pass slant, interference yes short post right short post that's coming right behind me out of the number two receiver three receiver set so I'm going up I'm kind of you know I kind of chop my feet I'm kind of grabbing his attention and then I go across his face I'm not really in the initial read of this play oh no so I I kind of turn my head and I look back not expecting the ball at all because there's another linebacker right across. And Joe throws it to me. And so I catch it. And I'm a little bit surprised. I catch it. We're watching it as you're describing it. Obliterated. Yeah, I get completely obliterated by Gerard Mayo. Now, I did hold on to the ball. Yes, yes. you did. It was a completion. And the very next play, 
I score a touchdown nice. on nice. a little out route. So I was seeing stars after that one, but that was also the year that I, I think it was the same year that Austin had his big concussion oh, and the whole con- big concussion push yeah. was coming to fruition. And I was surprised that on this play, cause he hit me under the chin. And so threw my head back. I was surprised we didn't get, or he didn't get a penalty for that. Yes, he should have. Hey, on our podcast. And he didn't. And so I jumped up in the very next play. It was, I think it was third down. And I ran a little out route and toasted the safety and then he threw me the I, I just, I honestly. One of my just, better routes actually immediately fall. I have a ball. headache right now after watching. Yeah, that. listening to our podcast, just YouTube. Dennis Pitta getting destroyed in that video will, <laughs> will pop up. But he did survive. Data, yeah. that's right, not, that's last not question good. for you. Yeah, favorite BYU tight end not named Dennis Pitta. Oh, man. I mean, there's there's a lot of really good ones. Uh, I'm going to say Chad Lewis because Chad's a dear friend of mine. I love Chad. Former walk-on. Chad's on. always former walk-on. We have a similar story. Chad's always been a huge supporter of me and always been a huge resource for me. Like when I was when I was playing at BYU, he would always come back and we'd, you know, talk through things and we'd, he'd run routes with us and, and do all kinds of stuff. And he was playing for the Eagles at the time. Chad's always a guy I looked up to. And uh, great choice. Yeah, you know, he, no, he I would definitely be the choice. I, I love that. Chad, one of the greatest human beings in the world. So, hey, Dennis, yeah. we're so glad to have oh, you. So fun to have you on, man. We hope you'll come back during the season and break down a couple of these games. But uh, one hour at Dennis Pitt. Yeah, sure. and, and we're not like Sports Nation. We always have time for Dennis. We <laughs> always have time for you. You know, you guys are very nice over here. I'm used to getting on these BYU podcasts and being a very hostile environment, <laughs> you know, that's with Jerem and, and, and that crew. And that's so not what we I, do. I just felt, I felt like I was welcomed with open arms, and I really appreciate it. This I is feel all... like I could tell you guys my deepest, deepest darkest secrets, which I'm, sounds like a lot of people next, have. Next, t- next but, time uh, you come on, we'll get you. We're we'll therapists. Get you. Eventually, you get off For, and you go, you know yeah. what? I feel bad. I should have said I should have said you know, shared this with Dave and Blaine because <laughs> so next time we expect something, okay. you know, d- to come out. Cause we are therapists. It's like a couch here. I will. I'll, I'll think of something I've been bottling up for years. All right. Hey, say hi we to your it. family. And thanks again. Thanks Dennis. So much, appreciate Dennis. It. We appreciate it, brother. Thank you guys. Have a good one. Dennis Pitta, one of the great tight ends in BYU history.